Hey everybody, welcome back to Movies to be Murdered by. This is Jesse, and I am here today um, with Jeff, as always, Jeff Watson. Say hello, Jeff. <laughs> Howdy, how's everyone doing? And we have with us today a super special guest. Um, her name is Peggy. She also goes by the moniker of Cinepeg, and that is because she is a horror movie expert, and she happens to be super talented. Um, Cinepeg, you can find on Etsy and on Instagram for her fingerless arm warmers, which have on each of them scenes from different movies. Thank you so much for coming, Cinepeg. Oh my good God. I, I, I feel like I've arrived. I'm at a horror podcast with awesome people. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm so happy. <laughs> you are here. You are here. And today we are going to be discussing 1968's movie, Rosemary's Baby. Oh, uh, all which hail. Were, which was... Um, Peggy's choice. So, Peggy, um, do you want to start us off by telling us why you chose Rosemary's Baby as your movie to to um, <laughs> to, to speak of today? I I guess I I chose it because, like you said in your last episode, it's a classic. It it really it's kind of um besides just being horror it's really it, it's a snapshot of film in the 60s um you know 1968 and in new york city it just feels so vivid so great and it's just one of those films that um i think i've seen safely over 30 times <laughs> um once i really got into it because it's just so rich with a lot of context and um, there's so much going on in it, so many issues, and it's, um, it's horror on a different level in, in terms of it's not, you know, I think at the, the time we were getting, you know, we were coming off the creature from the Black Lagoon, and, you know, these kind of monsters that were very much monsters, and this kind of subverted it and was like, all right, so the monster is actually the grandparents living next door to you and um and it's it's the people right next to you and right i really love that about this film that it kind of makes the horror ordinary and that's just as horrific right right i uh, i totally agree i totally agree if it upends all your notions you know you know you're going in to watch um you know a scary movie but it's also at, you know at first you're like wow this movie looks really good um, and then you're like, wow, this movie looks beautiful. <laughs> and the, everybody in this movie, you know, is interesting looking and they're good actors. And it's just this couple walking into a building, looking, you know, for their new, their new home, you know, and you just, it, it really, it really upends your expectations. Um, it, it's, it's quite something. <laughs> it's quite something. Yeah. Do it's. I mean, have, oh, so go ahead. Oh, oh no, go on. You please. <laughs> um, do you both of you um, have any? I, I'm going to get into this right away because the movie was directed by Roman mm. Polanski, um, and we all know now, you know, um, that he is a trash baby um, because he uh, raped. Was it a 14-year-old girl? I believe um, so. Yeah, 13 or 14-year-old girl um, and was brought up on charges and fled the U.S. Um, back to France and in order to, you know, avoid prosecution and jail time and hasn't been back since. He's a very controversial figure because um, he is a talented director and he's also, you know, a rapist. So do you guys want to talk about how that did or did not affect your viewing of this movie? And I mean, I just want to put it out there that there's no right or wrong answers. We all know um, his crime. 
none of us, none of the three of us approve of that. We are, you know, we completely, you know, are, uh, you know, it's disgusting what he did. And we're all on the same page with that. But in terms of how, if anything, that affects your viewing of the movie, um, Jeff, I don't know if you have an opinion about this or not, but I thought I'd, we could start with you. Yeah, I think, you know, I watched it again. You know, I, I hadn't watched it in maybe 10 to 15 years. And um, so I didn't know as much, obviously, then as I know now in terms of all of that. Uh, it, it definitely gave me a different feel to the film. Uh, at one point, I had to remind myself to not think about him and just focus on the film itself. Um, you know, and there, for me, there were definitely some moments in the film where I could, I could kind of feel his take on it and immediately started thinking, well, I wonder if this is why he shot this the way or, you know, this way or you know, made certain decisions um, with with the characters. Uh, so, I, I mean, it, it definitely was in the in the back of my mind uh, when I was watching, for sure. Gotcha. Um, Peggy, what do you, what if any, what if anything do you have um, to add about that? Um, well, here's my take on that, because I feel like we're, we're kind of now at a point and we're, you know, maybe it was, you know, the Me Too movement was helpful, but we're now at a point where we're kind of, we're seeing a lot of artists um, kind of like, we're seeing the not so pretty side of some of them. And um, Polanski indeed is this um, in this and I, it, it hurts, but I think it hurts me because movies are like art forms and, um, when I get touched by something, um, a movie or something, like I, I was discussing this with my awesome friend um, earlier and she brought up that, you know, art hits us in our emotional gut if it's really good. And when you find out that perhaps a monster made the art and it, it just, it complicates things perhaps a little bit. And I guess how I try to look at it, Jess, is I mean, he didn't just make, I mean, Rosemary's Baby wasn't just Roman Polanski. That was a village that made that movie. Um, he just gets all the credit for being the director. So it wasn't just him that made this masterpiece, but um, I am, I, I feel sometimes like he's, uh, um, it, the, the fact that he's been allowed to continue his career uninterrupted, um, it, 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 it gives you pause when you watch his work. But at the same time, I, I can't hate Rosemary's Baby because of what he did years after he made it or a few years after he made it. Um, I, w I don't agree at all with what he did. Um, and I don't think he intentionally m m meant to make this amazing feminist horror film. Like, he, you know, I think he, like you said, Jess, I had talked with you previously and he... I believe he kind of, um, he didn't know how to write scripts at this point. And I think you had said he, he just verbatim almost took this from the script, which was why it was such a great movie or book to movie um, example. But um, yeah, I don't know how you feel like that. Um, I, I go in circles. Of... Yeah, I go in circles. Like, you know, I go in circles. Um, I, I didn't, I didn't hesitate to watch the movie again um and i didn't hesitate to watch it i think it was like a year or two ago when i i like to do um from time to time i'll do like these mini stretches where i'll um read a book and then watch the movie or i'll watch a movie and then i'll read the book um so that i can get like a full a full like 360 view of the story and i didn't i didn't pause to like i didn't have any 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 and I didn't feel any like any worse to like not watch the movie or to watch it because of what you said, you know, it was what he did was horrific and unspeakable, but um, it happened after this movie was made. And I had also, wa I had seen this movie prior to ever knowing yep. the full story yeah. about Roman Polanski. 
Um, but I still do go in circles around the around this topic because I feel like there's not really a right answer. The only the only right quote unquote thing is to, you know, to not agree and to always be vocal about what the person did, um, mm -hmm. their, their crime. Um, and then also like speaking to what Jeff said, I also watched the movie through the lens of, you know, you know, is he, is, you know, like, is that scene with Rosemary being raped by Satan <laughs> is, you know, is that a coincidence? You know what I mean? Like it's, is, is, did he, mm. was it so, I mean, I know he didn't write the book that this was based on, but like, you know, is it a coincidence that he filmed it a certain way? Is it, you know, how much of this came out of his own disturbed psyche? Like, you know, and, and so, yeah, you know, well, we can't really, we can't really ever get answers to that, Yeah, you know, and, um, so I'm not really, I'm not really sure that there is an answer. I was just kind of wondering what you guys, what you guys thought about all of that. Um, moving on to another subject, how awesome, I just <laughs> want to give a props. How awesome is the, po the poster art for this movie, The Green? Oh, I'm sorry. I own the poster. So yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> it's great. And I, when I work at the George Eastman Dryden Theater when it's actually functioning. And um, we get to take dibs, the workers at the theater, we all take dibs on movie posters, like full size if we like them. And they played that, um, I feel like in the, the fall this past year, and I was like, mine, mine, mine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I just always, I always, it's uh, iconic. It's great. It's interesting. I think it works. It's like one of those, one of those um, posters where if you just change one little thing, it probably would look, would look kind of, you know, immature. But it really works for this movie. I agree. I mean, it's a very, it's a green poster, and it's it's got the green tones from her dream because mm -hmm. she is flooded with that green smoke, um, and. It, it's just it it layers it you know it's following what the movie was kind of showing us that green kind of haze of the you know maybe it's the tannis root haze i have i have no no idea but yeah the the poster is very um it, it means her face looks like a landscape yeah it does it does jeff i was wondering like um you know Coming to this movie, like you said, you, there, it, it'd been like a long time mm -hmm. since you, you know, since you'd seen it and coming to it now, like, were there any performances that you felt really stood out to you? Obviously, I feel like Mia Farrow's performance was just amazing. Um, mm. I, I thought that, you know, you could see, you could kind of get on that roller coaster ride with her of starting out where she did and then getting to that descent and then you know getting back to the end there um like we spoke about before we started recording uh, i i mean i thought that a lot of the performances i can't really just i can't really pick out one other than hers but i thought that overall uh it was a well acted movie by everyone involved I mean everyone had their different parts and I felt like each person played it extremely well and I mean even down to uh Minnie with her you know, <laughs> with how she how she acted and you know she's just obnoxious um oh she nailed and, it let's put it yeah, that way <laughs> yeah I mean she but she just she nailed it and you know you, and once you start seeing the more sinister side of people, I mean, even seeing the the slight changes in demeanor and body language and facial expressions, I, mm. I felt like everyone really, uh, really did a great job in the movie. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, Peggy, what do you what do you think? What are some of the standout? I know the whole cast is is great, it's, you know, but what are some of the standout <laughs> performances within this like you know rich cast of characters? <laughs> 
Well, okay, so this rich cast of characters, first of all, I think Polanski was really smart at how he cast the, um, the, the cult people, the, the neighbors, the elders, because I believe those are all <clears throat> seasoned actors, you know, from the 40s and 50s. They're all well-known kind of trusted faces. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of people going into the movies at that time, a lot of that was like part of that aspect. But uh, besides Pharaoh, which I'm really on Jeff's page with because it's, um, she just a standout amazing. Um, I love, um, we, we should give a small shout out to uh, Charles Grodin because this is where he first appeared in film. And man, oh man, I know most of you guys love Beethoven or Midnight Run, but I know him from the great Muppet caper. So every time I see him in this, I'm just like, oh, in a few years, you're just going to make a little Peggy so happy. Um, <laughs> and, you know, so, um, it, his performance is, you know, semi-terrifying in that what he's doing is terrifying but I also give a big strong shout to John Cassavetes um her the man playing her husband is um yeah. he's a stellar actor and just an interesting person and you hate him in this movie and he's he's done his job if, if you actually hate him and so um he is one of the most despicable i think even worse than many in the cult i think he's the almost the true villain um in this i completely agree i think that um guys guy who is john cassavetti's um character's name um rosemary's husband um guy is the most despicable character in the movie um how he just manipulates his wife and every aspect of his wife's life to his own gain is just horrible but um you know that kind of that kind of makes me think why don't um why don't i just quickly uh, run down the synopsis of the movie. And, oh yes, <laughs> and you guys and you guys feel free to you know jump in if I leave anything out. But the story of Rosemary's Baby, and I'll try to make this very quick. <laughs> um, as many of you already know, uh, Mia Farrow plays the titular Rosemary. She is a young wife. Um, her husband and her uh, find an apartment um, in what is called the Bramford house, um, which was actually the Dakota, I believe, in New York City, um, that he is an actor, she is a, a housewife, and she wants to have a baby. Uh, he's an actor who is really trying hard to get his big break. Um, they are pretty much friendless in the city, with the exception of one friend, an older man named Hutch, that is particularly close to Rosemary. And they become friendly-ish with the elderly couple that lives next door to them on the seventh floor. And they have dinner one night. The couple seems interested in hanging out with them um, once the wife uh, determines that Rosemary is interested in having a baby. So... <laughs> they have sorry. yeah they had sorry they have dinner they're gonna together. have a baby <laughs> yeah, they're gonna have a baby um so they're they they come across as a little eccentric a little odd but nothing really you know nothing doing nothing harmful just sort of an older new york city couple and um we see um roman the the male of the the two elderly couple um talking to guy um kind of off to the side then we see that Guy has a, a very fervent interest in hanging out with them, as, you know. Yeah, with, so with suddenly. <laughs> yeah, suddenly he wants to hang out with them. Uh, Rosemary really isn't interested. She finds them, you know, off-putting. And basically what unfolds is that, and it's not, it's not revealed explicitly to the audience, um, but... Um, Guy decides to, to like, you know, sign off on them having a baby together. Um, she gets pregnant and suddenly um, Minnie and Roman, the elderly couple, wants to just, you know, be all about them and be in their lives and be their best friends. And Rosemary um, 
changes doctors to the doctor that they recommend. Basically, they sort of subsume them like into all of their mm-hmm. <laughs> into their all of their social circles, into their life. Um, you know, uh, Rosemary at sev- at several times, you know, sort of tries to reach out to her old friend group and her old friends just to be just to have them chased away or dead. Find you know they end up dead. Um, mm and kind of like enveloped back into the group and graces of Minnie and Roman and her husband Guy. Um, Her husband Guy becomes very sort of, begins to act very shady towards her. Um, She has a dream where she is raped by Satan. I must say, Jess, I I just want to just interject and say that dream sequence is everything to me. It's so good. It's so well done. Go on. It's very, it's very well, it's, It's really well done. Um, So, um, you know, Rosemary at this point, like, knows that something's wrong. She suspects that they're witches. Um, She suspects that they've, that they want her, her unborn child to, you know, sacrifice to possibly drink blood from. She is given a book by her friend who ultimately dies um, about witches. She starts to really lose her marbles um, because she is realizing how powerless she is in this situation. She's, you know, in frightful health at one point. Like, she just is, has been, like, her health has been just declining rapidly. She looks horrible. When she has a party at some point just to see her old friends, and they all comment on how awful she looks, and she does. She's pale. She's lost weight except for her belly, and she just looks like she's going to die, you know? Um, Yeah. But at every turn that she tries to help herself to get herself out of this, out of this strange situation, um, she is sort of rebuked. She tries to go to her old doctor. Her old doctor sells her out oh, and calls oh, her husband. Mr. Broden. Yeah, Charles Broden. No, he, he no sells- Mr. Broden. <laughs> he that sells is not her out. happiness, Miss Piggy. No. Oh. And he, uh, he calls her husband and the other, you know, the, the, witch, the witchy, the witchy doctor. And she just can't get away from these people. She can't get away from these people to the point where she's just so stressed out that uh, she goes into labor. They tell her that she lost her baby, which is not true. Um, she hears, she hears the baby crying through the walls of the apartment um, and makes her way over to um, Minnie and Roman's apartment. This is the, in the final scene, she goes to their apartment um, and she brings a knife with her, God bless her. And you know, <laughs> thinking, that she'll, thinking that she'll overtake you know, the, the, these people and take her baby back. But what she doesn't realize, the horror of the movie as shown in this last scene, is that she has conceived and delivered Satan's child. She didn't The realize, Antichrist. Yeah, the Antichrist. All of these people aren't witches, they're Satanists. Um, they have been waiting for, you know, Satan to choose his, you know, bride, so to speak, and he chose Rosemary. Um, basically, then we find out that you know because of guy's strange behavior you you know can put two and two together that guy sold her out to this couple um to have the baby so that they could have she could have satan's baby in exchange to further his career um so he is becoming more and more famous he's getting more offers you know big offers from hollywood and he's sold his wife out for that so that's how she got into the situation and now she has given birth to satan's baby and all these satanists are worshiping it and like kind of you know revering her they kind of start to revere her um as the leader roman tells them all this is you know adrian's mother adrian's the name of the baby and (laughs) show her some respect and you know towards the end of the movie she just you know she moves over to the crib to the cradle she sees the baby and in i think like the most horrific expression Mm -hmm. of horror uh she just her eyes bug out and she wants to scream you know she covers her mouth when she sees the child 
because the child, we never, as an audience, you never see the baby. We never see the baby, but honestly, to see Rosemary's face at the end that scene is just enough. I mean, the, the look on her face scared the pants off of me, you know, that that's was, a great point so terrifying like it just you can feel it like I would seeing her do that I would run right out the door and never look <laughs> back you know because something would, was obviously terribly wrong and but then like to, like a few minutes later um, one of the Satanists is rocking the baby's cradle too hard she kind of jumps in and is as is her motherly instinct to the leader of the Satanist cult Roman um tells the other lady to beat it and lets Rosemary, you know, rock the cradle gently and just kind of very purringly just says to her, like, you know, it's okay. You don't have to join our cult, but you, you know, if you want to be, we would love to have you be like his mom, like just take care of him. You're his mom, like be his mom. And that's just kind of where the movie ends. You know, um, it's a fantastic movie. I, think that all three of us would recommend it. I don't want to speak for the both of you. I know Peggy, I know you would recommend it. Jeff, I think you would recommend yes. it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Um, I think the, the, <clears throat> there's, there, it was really very clever of them not to show the child. Um, yes, because would, in the book, they do show the child. Uh, when, when I read it in high school, I remember especially how they described the baby's eyes in the book. The baby's eyes look just like, if you recall, the dream sequence she had where she kind of gets a deep look into who's on top of her. Yeah. Um, they have those yellow eyes with the black slits, and that's exactly how they describe, you know, the baby. And I think that the baby has talons as well. So I agree 100% with you, Jess. It, it was so smart to not show that because I think what you can picture from the look on her face is way scarier than what they can show us. Right, and it would be dating the movie because of the limited, like, <laughs> the limited special effects that they have. Do you know what I mean? Like, like watch, watching, like, looking at a scary baby from the 60s, what they could have created or done up, <laughs> you know, a baby to look like is, is probably laughable, would be laughable to us even in the 80s, you know what I mean? And then, like, not to mention now, you know, in the 21st century. So I think it, it, it cleverly, like, you know, leaves that alone. Um, and it also kind of makes it more fantastical because I mean, we're not, we, if, unless you're in a cult, unless you're in a satanic cult or involved in like a witch's coven, and I don't even know then that they, that they can answer this, but I mean, has anybody ever seen the devil? Do you know what I mean? Like with their own eyes? Like, I don't know that, that that's actually happened. And so I think that that also speaks to that, you know, that, uh, that notion that like you know we've not we've never no one's ever seen what this thing this creature you know this demonic presence could actually physically look like so why show it you know why try to why try to create it um i i don't know that's just that's just my take no i i completely agree with it i'd love to hear what jeff thinks too because i mean um sometimes horror you know movies can really rely on the the shock value and this like you just said the special effects and i mean did that disappoint you jeff at all like watching it did no. or no not not at all i i was actually happy with that because i think i think a lot of times with movies especially horror movies <clears throat> they they don't leave things to the imagination and seeing someone's reaction to something that's horrific is a lot of times more horrific for the viewer as opposed to seeing what they're looking at so you can kind of you know develop in your own mind my goodness you know what is this what does this baby look like you know how how bad is it and you know, <laughs> that, that kind of plays off of your own imagination which allows you to you know which allows the movie to kind of even stick with you a little bit longer because you're thinking okay what in the world is that baby <laughs> like and why did she have that look on her face and you know you, you just think of all the horrible things that could be and and that's I think that's the mark of a good movie is to not show some of the horrific scenes and I know some of the movies we watch you know you you know see some of these 
kill scenes and they're horrific but you know in other other movies you don't see it you just hear something or you see it you see the person's reaction to it and it's like okay i i really appreciate the fact that they just let the imagination run instead of trying to you know scare us with a jump scare or scare us with a you know a, a not so well done special <laughs> effects baby especially <laughs> in the 60s there um but yeah I, I i really appreciated the fact that they didn't show the child yeah because i mean everything you just said too i agree completely like when a, a horror a horror film is pretty risky when they kind of decide to hold back it's a gamble definitely um um because the genre is so used to you like you said jump scares and maybe a bit of gore or something so when a director can keep something really suspenseful and eerie and not and let us use some of our imagination to fill in the blank i mean i think people who read books really get these movies <laughs> almost because they were used to reading books and filling in the imagination for ourselves so it's it's an element of book reading to me when they don't like you know they might describe something but you're the one making up the the scenario in your head You know what I thought was was interesting too, if we want to like just just switch gears a little bit, um, was that Polanski had actually wanted Sharon Tate for the lead role of Rosemary. Um, mm. He wanted to um, have like a, a very robust girl next door type, mm. but um, I think the studio had wanted um, had really wanted. Um, Mia Farrow and and ended up being you know the, I mean the role of a lifetime for her mm, absolutely she was just in, you know she, I I don't I don't think anybody could picture anybody but Mia Farrow and her wayfishness <laughs> and her like vulnerability you know because she's so vulnerable to all of the gaslighting that goes on in this movie by her by her husband Guy and then by the neighbors and then by everybody literally everybody that comes into contact with the contact um, yes light and rosemary she, exactly and she's so she's so frail you know she's so thin and small and frail looking and she's so gorgeous you know it all kind of makes sense um i don't know but what do you what do you guys think of? i i know that for me um I, you know, her character through that movie, throughout the whole movie is always, I don't know if e either of you picked up on this or it's just my wild imagination, but when everyone's talking to her, um, save maybe Hutch, they're always kind of talking down to her. Like they're, it, like she's a child that doesn't get it, you know, like, mm -hmm. no, yeah. Rosemary, we told you not to read any books. Like, that's the you know and and it's like so the first part of the movie she's um this wayfish you know long hair and then we get that that insane haircut um that almost like further just makes her look like a child literally mm -hmm. and it's kind of like so in the beginning we're already getting this she's being handled like with kid gloves with the men um and then you know she cuts her hair and physically she looks so much more fragile and little yeah. and boyish and but what's more amazing to me is she's still ferocious in that role like she never gives up despite that frail look to her like she's she's trying to do anything for that baby till the very end yeah absolutely um, which Absolutely. was yeah which was kind of great a juxtaposition with her physicality looks so weak and you know, sickly, and and I know it caused a big stir at the time, you know, I think a lot of women, or people were not used to a woman cutting her hair that short, you know, mm -hmm. like, save, I mean, I think it was even shorter than Twiggy's was that supermodel that was out at the same time, she had more of a mod kind of Beatles look, and Rosemary had this much shorter haircut that was, like, severely parted and it just had a very boyish look to it like she looked like a little schoolboy you know yeah yeah the looks in this movie the the costume design the hair the hair and makeup um 
I thought was just, I mean, looking, you know, we look back on it from nowadays, from our point of view in the, you know, current, in the present moment, um, just everybody looked so cool. Even Minnie, their eccentric <laughs> elderly next door neighbor, like when she, in that classic shot of her looking, of, of Rosemary looking through the people oh. and, and Minnie's there and her, she's got an updo with a <laughs> scarf tied around it and some really like outrageous colors on her face and makeup it's just but she looks really cool you know like everybody looks really cool all of rosemary's outfits are awesome um oh you know my God. God all of everybody's Gordon. just i know everybody's just very stylish in this movie i think that that is i'm guessing because i don't you know i don't know who the costume um directors etc were but hmm. I just, I think it was a nod to Roman Polanski's, like, European nature, you know, they're so <laughs> super stylish, like, and I think, like, a lot of this stuff, just everything looked very stylish, I know, I think he was very, like, specific in how he wanted the movie to look, um, and I don't know, I give that, I give that a lot of credit. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely, it's a, it's a feast for the eyes while you're watching it, I yeah. mean, it's a really, it's, a, it's gorgeous to look at. Yeah, it's very cool. I just, um, I just can't, I'm, I mean, just, I can't get over, I feel like, I feel like Mia Farrow really should have won, like, a bazillion <laughs> awards. I know she was nominated yeah. for, you know, for a bunch of awards, you know, including the Golden Globes and, you know, um, the BAFTA, etc. But, like, I just feel like she should have won all of them. She was so good in this movie. She's so young. She was, like, 22, 22. years old. Yeah. yeah, she's, like, 22 years old. Um, she was getting, she was getting a divorce from Frank Sinatra, who, you know, whose uh, dusty butt, like, left her <laughs> because he didn't want her to do this movie. So he decided he was going to divorce her and then serve, and she got served with, you know, with paper. He gave her a choice, like, me or the movie, and she was like, well, I'm doing this movie. And he's like, all right, see you later. And Talk about a Rosemary's Choice, because seriously, it's like she's facing the exact same thing in the movie, but she's really, you know, triumphing in her own life by kicking mm -hmm. him to the curb. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, so, I don't know, any, any other thoughts about Rosemary and, and, her, and her poor devil baby? <laughs> um, I, just if I, I may, and it's, it's, so, it's so silly, but I like... I really love talking about that, that dream sequence in the, um, mm -hmm. in the, in the kind of, it's almost the center of the film because it's done so well. It's, it, it's almost like a stream of consciousness filming. Like, you know, we see her being taken to bed. She's had the moose, the mouse bite, <laughs> and, um, she's basically, you know, completely out of it. And, suddenly she's on a boat you know she's on a bedded sea then she's on a boat with like no clothes on it except a bathing suit and it's all happening very quickly and she's still talking to her husband like consciously kind of through it and um and then as the dream deepens like I don't know if you guys remember this but there's a shot of her being like raised on a platform and it looks like she's looking at the Sistine Chapel ceiling yeah. And what's amazing is when it kind of shifts a little bit, we see it's the drawers of the closet and the, 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 there's like a bit of the, you see that closet that they never understood why it was barricaded in the beginning. And we right. see Rosemary's paper that she had put to line the shelves with. So it's like you're seeing reality mixed with a dream because she's not completely down because she didn't eat all of it. And um, it's like, in that moment where she's realizing it and the the green smoke is kind of enveloping her and it's very hazy and it's confusing she's like she springs up and is like this isn't a dream this is really happening and then you see a pillow just gently over her face and then the next image which is like to me again catholic guilt um you know she's suddenly we see a pope or a cardinal very gallantly dressed coming up to her sides and she's asking for forgiveness like saying i'm so sorry father it was the mouse bite am i forgiven and he's like oh absolutely and of course as she kisses the ring it's really the tannis root charm that 
Minnie and Roman has given her. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think that dream sequence was just full of symbolic stuff. And it was, again, you're seeing the villains and they're not what you expect. They're old naked people, you know, surrounding yeah. a bed, chanting. Um, and it's very, like, both of you have tossed this word. It's very eerie. It's very weird. And it's just always, when I get to that scene in the movie, I get so excited because it's just such a great interpretation of a dream when you're kind of still a little awake. Yeah, definitely the images, definitely the uh, the sequence of like events in that dream follows dream logic. Mm-hmm. And I think, it, I think it was like really ambitious of the filmmaker and his crew and, you know, the producers to try to nail that scene down because dreams you can't nail down you know unless you're David Lynch he's the (laughs) only one who's ever like been able to like nail down dreams and like you know do like like you know an amazing job at them but like you know it's it's very it's it's just it's I feel like it was like a long shot but they did pull it off they pulled it off like they didn't like the whole images there are the images of um, the Kennedys yeah you know and that that could have come across as really corny you know but it didn't it's dream logic like it's dream logic and it made sense for the time because they were in the public eye at that time you know like they were like they were still much in the public consciousness so like you know, and then having the Pope there makes sense. There was like all of this religious imagery. She, there's so much of this movie is going on where like the movie's happening and Rosemary's living out the day to day, but Rosemary really knows like what the deal is and what is happening behind the curtains in her like unconscious mind and in her subconscious mind. You know, like she, that's why she you know she unfurls you know the fact that yeah this you know this isn't a dream this is really happening like Mm -hmm. she 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 really knows what the deal is um throughout you know the parts of the movie where sinister things are happening to her behind her back you know she does know but she can't access it while she's awake necessarily she tries to and she gets stopped at every point by the Cassavetes or by Guy her husband or you know just by the circumstances that they set up for her um, or by the fact that you know women aren't believed you know I know you talked about the hysterical woman Peggy like yeah by that whole notion of of society at that time treating women who are, you know, who have an opinion or who are trying to alert someone that they're in danger, you know, of being considered the hysterical woman. I mean, she's blockaded at every point. So all she has is her dreams to like tell her and and explain to everybody like what the deal is. And so there's all this, like you, like you said, it's, it's, it's a difficult scene to watch. You know what I mean? It's a difficult, it's a difficult, it's a difficult, you know, it's difficult to watch that because you do get a sense of how she could be yes, helped in this situation and how she could help herself if she wasn't so helpless. And ultimately I, she is totally helpless. This is a story I mean, of, of, of a woman who is, you know, completely gaslit and helpless um, because of um, personal life, her, you know, her husband, because of, you know, society. Yeah, I was going to say because of the times, too. It was because of, I mean, the, fact, you know, because of society yeah. and the times, you know, and, um, you know, she just cannot, she cannot, you know, get out of harm's way, try as she might. Um, I think the scene that really nailed for me um, a part that like and it's right after the dream it's it, it really cements the horror of the situation to me and I think I told you this Jess it's uh, every time I come to this line it's like hard shudder I just um, it's when she wakes up from the dream and it's a very personal nightmare for any of us women to think our boyfriends or spouses would take advantage and literally rape us during the night um Mm -hmm. but when she wakes up seeing you know it was supposed to be the night where they were going to create a baby but she was unconscious and there's scratches all over her and you know he's kind of totally shaking it off and gaslighting her right away just like 
don't worry, honey, I already trim, trimmed my nails. And then, like, I think the worst comment is, though, yeah, it was kind of fun in a necrophile sort of way. And every time I hear that, I'm like, divorce, yeah. Rosemary, divorce. <laughs> you know, yeah, but it wasn't really an now. option then. Would you, I'm sorry, would, would you, I agree with you, Peggy, totally. And would you say, Jeff? It's like, get out of there right now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, and it, that's what's scary about the time frame that she's in, because that wasn't that wasn't even a law then like it's not illegal at that point to rape your wife like she would have no legal standing anyway um it's so it's just that that moment jeff i, I love that that got to you too because it's just that moment where you're like oh this is when you walk you know mm -hmm. you you or you kick him out of the nice apartment you know you just you go live with your sister or your family the big family you keep talking about in the movie yeah, that's a, that was a question I had just to, to, you know, kind of, you know, monkey bar off of that. Like, where the heck was anybody's family? Where the heck was her family? She never called anybody. Like, her mother wouldn't have wanted to come and, like, be with her pregnant daughter. You know what I mean? Like, where was anybody? I mean, you know, better off that they weren't because they would have been killed or something. But, you know, where was her whole family? I guess, I don't know. I think, you know what, maybe, maybe it's a white people thing. Yeah. Because like, seriously, it's a because hockey like, thing. Oh yeah. no. Maybe, maybe I don't know. Is it or is not? I have no idea. I'm just thinking I, like, where was everybody's family? Because like, I know, you know, for for me and my family, we're Latin. Um, you know, the family would be around. <laughs> like, yeah, like you, they'd be all around. your business, like, like mini. <laughs> You just well, you just have you no, know, you know, you just you have your family around, or and if you yeah. don't, you you know get yourself to your family frequently, you know. I think that for me, what it is with the family, and I don't know if it's just my take on it, but the setting of them being in New York is like, it's so urban and it's such a fast, crazy life that it almost like, it feels like they're so far away from that kind of a a relationship with a family almost that would come and visit them in Manhattan, you know, or something. Yeah. It's like the city yeah. itself is its its own family character, remember? Because it's like, I yeah. feel like it, it it's, it, and it also could just simply be lack of attention to detail on the author's part or Polanski's part where they don't really see a part where it's like, we really don't need the family visiting at this moment. Like they just may, maybe didn't see a way to put them in that felt organic enough to the film. I don't know, Jeff, did you think of that at all? Like, you know, like kind of like where's where's her family at? Yeah, I mean, I, I did a little bit, but I, I think, you know, that point of, you know, thinking of the time and where they were and you think about, I think she said she was from Omaha. Yes. If I'm not mistaken. So honestly, you go from Omaha to New York City and it's like a completely different world. So maybe, maybe that, that's what happened. May, I mean, you, you start to kind of dissect it on your own, but, you know, did they get upset that she left that life and mm. now she's with this actor, this big time actor, and, you know, maybe they don't feel like they're good enough to be around or good enough to come to the city that, you know, that kind of struck me a little bit because I know that, you know, if, if my parents were still around and I was having a kid, they, they'd be there. Like they, yeah, it wouldn't matter. They, I mean, you know, my mom, God rest her soul. If she had been around when my, when my kids were born, she probably would have moved to where I was living just to, just so she could be there and, <laughs> you know, and offer the help and, and do all of that stuff. But yeah, it, it did, it did stand out to me a little bit, but you know, I think with some of that, you can, at least for me, I just kind of took my, my own thing of maybe, you know, it's just a completely different world. Maybe they didn't feel like they would want to intrude on her elegant lifestyle at this point. Uh, but I, I do have, you know, you talked about scenes, and I don't know if you guys caught this at the end, but I thought, you know, one of the, one of the moments that kind of broke some of the tension I think her name is Laura Louise. When, <laughs> yeah. when she sticks Laura her, Louise. When she, yeah, when she sticks her tongue out 
at Rosemary. <laughs> yes. Um, I thought that was like the most hilarious thing and where it was placed and how it was done, how subtle it was. <laughs> yes. It, it, I just, I cracked up at that because it's just like, okay, you're in this very serious, <laughs> tense moment. And then you have this elderly lady sticking her tongue out like she's about four, you know. And it, totally. It, oh, it Laura just, Louise. Yeah, it it, cra- it cracked me up so so much. So. Yeah, it was to- it was perfect. As so it was like, she was like, Roman, you tell her like. You know, yeah, like, like she wants to be the surrogate her. mother. Yeah, she wants to be the one. You know, like the little kid. You tell her to leave to go away. Tell her to leave us alone, Roman. Tell her. And he's like, Laura Louise. Go sit down. And then she like sticks her tongue sticks out. And I'm like, out. what? Oh my God. Oh you my God. Jeff, I'm so happy you brought that up because that was such a great moment of levity in that scene where you're like, okay, I'm taken out of that horror for a second. And yeah. it, it, it's it's right up there with also when she's in shock sitting down and Minnie gives her a drink and she's like, Is there tannis root in this? And you know, she's like, No, nah, just Lipton's tea, you know. <laughs> walks away and it's again another moment where you're like okay then they're back to normal grandparents again like it's just it's nuts yeah I think Laura Louise was like one of the scariest (laughs) (laughs) characters in the movie right because it's like I've met people like this like (laughs) older people who act like they're like like little kids but not because of like senility or because of some sort of an issue just because you can tell that that's how they acted their whole lives life yeah you know it's or a like, character like, trait right or like you know 30 somethings who act like they're six it's really <laughs> odd and that those people really freak me the heck out it's like when someone <laughs> acts like that i'm like okay nice seeing you bye you know like <laughs> never well, again i think the scene where she she comes in and i i think where we first meet Laura Louise is when it's right after they have the first dinny with Minnie and Roman and Ro- and her husband Guy's like I'm gonna go over and hear stories and she's like yeah I think I'm gonna stay here and read a book and suddenly Minnie and Laura Louise are at the door going oh I, I you know I just wanted you, you to meet my friend Laura Louise and I mean that woman comes in like a bulldozer talking about how her period affects her and I mean it's yeah. just like she <laughs> Rosemary is just she's stuck like you just look at her like because of sociality and nicety she's like yeah okay come on sit down knit knit away you biddies you know while she's just you know staring there but yeah Laura Louise comes in like a force and just yeah, you're right. It just she wanted I think she wanted Rosemary's spot and she was a little too old for that. Yeah, totally. Well even Roman says that, like Yeah, he's like it's, it's not like, right. They can't yeah, they can't like Minnie and Laura Louise, they they wanna, you know, be the surrogate moms, but they're too old. Like he's yeah. just, I love how he's he's, really yeah, old. he's, he's like, like they're, they're too old to do this. Like, 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 there, there's a reason you were chosen. <laughs> yeah. I'm just like, I don't know, I'm just wondering, like, I mean were they did they ever have to recruit to get like like younger people in their like circle because I mean they're all old and who's gonna like I mean do they are they just counting on Adrian the the devil's baby to like take over I mean is that the thing I mean I I mean okay like I read the sequel I read the oh, book sequel. dear I, I read, didn't go there Jess oh my I read goodness. I read Son of Rosemary <laughs> and I because I wanted to know it was once I found out there was a sequel I was like there's a sequel <laughs> well, you know and, like I would never watch a movie sequel to this movie because this movie is one of those movies that's just perfect the way that it, it stands is. alone yeah stands you don't alone. like don't don't mess with the movie but like I was like oh the book and it's written by the same author so it like it has a chance at least it's got a fighting <laughs> chance of being good it was so bad it was so, when you so told bad. me that that nixed me because I I didn't know there was a sequel till I started looking up research when I was watching this movie again and I just started laughing because you immediately you quashed everything when you're like yeah oh, and I'm no, like thank you I totally need to save bad. time <laughs> no I yeah I mean I'm I'm like you know like Jeff and I have talked about this before about how we like you know, can, like, take people's, you know, reviews, ratings, what have you, like, you know, with a grain of salt, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean it has to stop you from, you know, from, um, 
you know, watching the movie or reading the book or what have you, but I will save all of you time. Don't read the sequel. It's just <laughs> a bunch Keep- of nonsense. <laughs> Keep you know? the book. Yeah, the first one near and the dear. The first one's great. Yeah, the yeah. first one's great. The second one, no. The second one could have been good. It had like a good premise to start with, but then just went downhill so quickly and just was really disgusting. Like not in like a horror way, just like in a gross way. And it lost its way so quickly. So I would not recommend it. But like in but like I mean I'm just wondering, like, and I wondered about this too, you know, what is it? what is it is it trying to say anything by the fact that their cult and like their circle of satanists are just all this like an older crew almost like i don't know what do you guys think um i find it just again i go always back to the fact that it's very interesting that these aren't young robust satanic cult members like you say um it's again it's 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 subverting an expectation which i absolutely love though because it's Mm -hmm. i I, and and as far as how they i mean we meet that first girl in the very beginning um that's living with them and i think she wasn't supposed to be the real rosemary yeah and um i think what happened was there's a fight we hear through the walls where we hear Minnie screaming about she's not into it I told you she wouldn't be into it and you know sure and behold the next night the woman's you know has supposedly jumped from the window and is dead and that's how like you said the whole meeting of Roman and Minnie becomes you know like a a thing because they're trying to console these parent these grandparents like we're really sorry this woman that you took in and cleaned up from the streets died you know we yeah you know we feel for you guys and it's again it's I, I just think I love that it's an old cult that it's that it's this Roman's father who they're all following this this specific man um and uh I can't remember, remember what the character's name is which I feel bad not knowing that but there's um whoever Roman's father is Adrian Mercado okay that's it A- Adrian Mercado or something uh, they're all following this his old teachings so it's like the sun and it's it just hysterical seeing an old group doing this it's it's um it makes the horror almost more horrific in its own way yeah um it does it does absolutely because it's you see like the like the legacy like not the legacy but well yeah the legacy of this yeah. you know of this of this dude with his son who's now you know elderly and all of these elderly people who have live their lives you know worshiping satan and and um and then you see some of them like dr stapperstein their friend um the obstetrician who they have rosemary see like has like this you know has had this like flourishing famous huge career you know in um in medicine and i mean you know that like all of their successes have been you know are are based on their allegiance to you know the dark the dark lord you know I mean? like, yeah it's very unsettling so it's, it, it's terrifying it's i mean true. and then you they're going to have like roman I'm, I'm sorry not roman they're going to have guy who's going to be this you know super famous actor you oh, know you're right um, he's going to bring the new know. recruits in just that's what's going to happen yeah it's really weird like, too if, it's yeah. really weird too because like i mean i don't know if you guys notice this but it's like he doesn't really seem like he's that into it what he's into is getting the rewards oh, that he's abso- promised absolutely because um that scene after you know after he has the rosemary is really doing horrible with the, the pregnancy and she thinks she knows no not thinks she knows something's wrong even though everyone's gaslighting her the doctor her husband um, every, the neighbors just saying this is a weird pregnancy it's always weird and um, she basically gets a chance to um, I'm just losing, losing my train of thought it happens at 40 people it's very scary um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> but but like Rosemary I mean I, again it's really tricky but it's almost like we get to see she's being gaslit and um, they're basically like the husband at this party now sequence he's he's you know she's suddenly happy because she feels the baby kick right like she's like suddenly like oh my god the pain stopped and it it stops all at once and it it ironically stops the minute she 
screams, I'm going to go back to Dr. Hill and I'm going to do things my way. And um, suddenly the pain stops and she asks Guy to touch her belly. And that's my favorite part because he touches it like it's a fire. It's a hot stove. And he jumps back, like terrified. He knows what's in there. Yeah, totally. I totally agree. Jeff, did you did you notice that in the movie? I did. I did. I going back to what you what you asked though about it being older people. Honestly, for me in scary movies, two of the two of the things that really terrify me, two groups of people. Older people <laughs> and and babies. Oh my <laughs> god, I love you, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> like so, I mean, if it, if you have, you know, older people or demonic babies <laughs> or children, um, you've, you've accomplished a, a little bit of getting me a, a little bit on the edge of my seat. So, um, so yeah, that, that part for me was, was terrifying, but yeah, I thought that was interesting when he, when he wouldn't, he didn't really want to touch her stomach because, you know, as a, as a dad, I mean that's like one of the coolest moments. Is oh my when god! You first, you know, start feeling the baby kick and and all of those things. That's something that you look forward to, and then <laughs> yeah, you you don't was, jump away in complete right. abject, confused terror when right. she makes you touch her. Yeah, um, it it's it's I again I can't thank you guys enough for allowing me to discuss this with you because i'm having such a ball during this quarantine right now at least <laughs> nice. um nice. it's definitely it's it feels a bit like a slumber party and i love it um i you know both of you guys are so well versed in your films and it's really awesome just talking with you guys about it oh well i know we're, we're so happy to have you on absolutely oh you seriously know? you guys if you ever need another a person rallying i will do it anytime <laughs> i'm such a dork oh, i well, i love what you guys day, are doing one day we've got to get jesse to uh to watch saw and when we do oh that, is jesse i i and i hope you guys and i know we're kind of i'm diverting a bit from the topic but this is something i'm so intrigued with both of you i i want to see where your love of horror began like um I want to know what was your things that terrified you, but kind of intrigued you to keep like going back to the genre. Like Jeff, do you, do you want to, do you want to field that first? Sure. Sure. I, okay. I definitely will. I, I talked about this a little bit before we started recording, but um, if my older cousins are listening <laughs> right now, um, thank you guys so much for, <laughs> Uh, warping a young mind at the age of about four or five. Um, <laughs> I, I just, I was the youngest of all of my cousins. So uh, by, you know, by double digits. So, I mean, everyone was, you know, oh my older gosh. than I was. And, um, you know, just one, I never forget it. It was one Saturday night. Uh, my cousins were at my house. I think my mom was doing something for her job or, or whatever it was. And they came over and they said, Hey, you know, we're going to watch a movie. And they thought that I was, you know, just going to be asleep or in my room <laughs> or something like that. And um, I kept bugging them saying, I, I want to watch, I want to watch. And they said, Oh, we don't think you really want to watch this. And oh. they, you know, just kept doing it. So I, I finally got on their nerves enough to where they, uh, they actually held me down and uh, <laughs> we watched Friday the 13th. And, um, you know, at one point I tried to put my hands over my eyes. So they, you know, they both were sitting on either side of me. So then they hold down my legs and hold down my hands. And, uh, and, and I'm just, I'm sitting here watching this movie. And, um, <laughs> I did not sleep in my room for about two weeks after that. Um, but I thought that. I don't know. It was like I I enjoy the the sensation of being afraid, and yeah. I don't really know why, but um, <laughs> but I enjoyed it, and um, you know even to the point where you know my mom would get mad at me because I would sneak off to a store that was uh, right up the road from where I grew up, and they had 
uh, videos and I would go in and the store owner would allow me to go back into the video section and, you know, I'd kind of look around like I was about to steal something and um, I'd grab a horror movie or two and take it home and um, then my mom would find these videotapes and she's like, where are you getting these things from? And I obviously couldn't give up my, my source there, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's what it was. I just start, I started watching these films and I've been oh. ever since. It's so funny, Jeff, because I, I almost feel like that is such a traumatic event that it would have turned me off of horror for the rest of you my know, life. You know, <laughs> like for almost like, for like two weeks, it was it was traumatic because everything <laughs> I saw, everything I saw was like was Jason. Like I, I mean, we <laughs> where I grew up is a, a rural area. And there's a lot of woods and dirt roads and all that stuff. Even now, there's still dirt roads and. It looks like a scene out of a horror movie, and <laughs> um, and you know, I was I was afraid, and uh, I think I think what finally broke me of that is I think I was it may have been maybe a month or two after this um, I was I was at home, and my mom for whatever reason kept saying you know like why don't you you need to go clean your room you need to go clean your room and you know I was a kid I didn't want to clean my room and then she finally says hey bring bring me that shirt out of your closet that um that I've been asking you about I you know I want to make sure I clean it real well or something like that she made up and um I, I go to go into my closet I open the door turn the light on and one of my cousins is standing right there <gasps> with a Freddy Krueger mask and oh. the, um, and the hand and the, um, right. and the glove. And, um, uh, after I yelled and screamed for a little bit and cried, um, my cousin pulled it off and he's like, listen, it's just pretend, you know, it's just, it's just a mask. And he puts, <laughs> he puts the mask on me and, you know, I look in the mirror and I got the glove and I'm, you know, working the glove and it, you know, like ever since then it, I've not, I've had maybe two or three movies that have legitimately scared me since then. Really? Yeah. I want to know what those are now. <laughs> uh, the Exorcist. Uh-huh. Yeah. That's uh, basically <laughs> anything with demonic possession, but The Exorcist um, and The uh, Exorcism of Emily Rose. Oh, man. Oh, God. Um, Jennifer Carpenter starred in that, right? Yeah. She, I mean, physically, how she contorts her bodies and the oh, facial expressions she makes are the true horror of that for me. Because I, yeah. I just don't understand how anyone can contort like that. Um, but yeah. that's a performance that that's right up there with Linda Blair. <laughs> like, yeah. no, no questions. Yeah, and and honestly, like parts of uh, Sinister were <laughs> creepy for me as well. So especially given my, given my previous statement about demonically possessed children. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 That's awesome though. I love hearing that. What about, what about you, Jess? What was your, your dipping toe? Like what kind of. I have been on the search for like a decade or more as to, to find out why people like, like what, not just like, but why they are like fans and follow and watch mostly horror movies. Like people who are like horror movie buffs, who that's Me. their main genre. <laughs> yeah, who that's, that's their main genre. They go to cons and, and they collect, you know, um, all kinds of horror, you know, toys and posters and whatnot. I have like asked anybody that I could like, why do you like horror movies, you know? And it's never been a judgmental, you know, like, question. It's not like, why do you like horror movies? Like, they stink and you're crazy. Not like that at all. <laughs> Although I've had to explain that to some people. Like, listen, I'm asking sincerely. Like, I want to know why you like horror movies. Um, my main reason being, and I always say, like, you know, it's just my understanding that being afraid... And feeling fear is not a pleasant experience for most people. Oh, you no, know, that's, no. that's a 
like, you know, I know that's a generalization, but I think it's a fair one to make. And, um, and so, you know, given that horror movies are meant to pro like prompt feelings of fear and, and invoke like a sense of dread and, and all these things, you know, why do you like horror movies? And no one's ever been able to give me a clear answer. You know, like uh -huh. Jeff even said before, like, you know, there's like, you know, not like, you know, there's no real one reason, you know, it's, it's just that some people do, I know some people do enjoy the feeling of being scared or of getting scared. I get that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, it just was so alien to me. I just didn't understand it. And I wanted to know why I wanted someone to tell me why. And so I never got a clear answer on that. Um, and then I think that that question just began to sort of like find its way to me like me personally mm -hmm. and like why I was so averse to watching like horror movies why I was so scared of being scared and what was it that was really scaring me about like certain movies you know so yeah. um but I think so I think like it's probably just like a natural progression right like when you're kind of really curious about one subject for that subject to then kind of you know for you to end up taking on that subject as something that you like you know yeah um, yeah totally so I watched I remember I I watched the movie Get Out by Jordan Peele oh um, great and I know, and um, I, Jeff and I talked about a little bit about Jordan Peele on our previous episode when we discussed yes. green, when we discussed Green Room, and oh. his influence on us. Um, and Love, by the way, both of your responses to that really was <laughs> one, and I a special shout out here to the Jeff because. Uh, if I recall last episode, you were a little hesitant to share a personal take on it. And um, the awesome Jess just kind of cheerleaded you right through. And what you shared about your experience with Get Out, I loved because it was a perspective that is not very familiar to me. And it's important that it become familiar, you know, almost like to, it's just it's all these movies and horror stuff. It's getting to walk in someone else's shoes almost and feel a little terror for a moment. And, um, I really liked what you shared with, with get out. So yeah, totally loved the last episode you guys did. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so what, what I found was, um, I was, I was totally scared by that movie. I identified with, certain parts of that movie personal on a personal level that triggered me mm -hmm. um i um personally i have um managed and uh lived with post-traumatic stress disorder so there are certain things in that movie that were especially triggering and but that i think kind of you know i i didn't stop thinking about that movie i watched us I also, um, I have to say Jordan Peele and Ari Aster, because I, I watched um, Midsummer, whereas, yeah. I thought, whereas I thought that I wouldn't be able to, t to tolerate watching that movie because I had heard it was just so terrifying. Um, I know that um, the, I have heard the term elevated horror used in conversations with directors and also just between critics and they always despise that term but they feel like they have to use it i don't despise that term i think that within a genre of any of any kind of whether it's literature or anything within a genre you know it's it's okay to like you know kind of like parcel out if it helps you make sense of something it's not necessary you don't have to label some things with labels mm -hmm. but you know for me coming into horror i felt like it was it was very helpful to me to get to these movies that were a lot of thought and like mm. sort of like philosophies and psychologies behind what was happening um, and that I could that I could make sense of it that way, and that that would help me cope with the scary parts of the movie. You know, like the parts where like someone looks deformed, or where you know someone is murdered in a you know vicious way. So mm -hmm. I just also think you know my mate also just besides all that 
jibber jabber that I just spat out. <laughs> the main reason I really like horror is because horror is the only genre. I'm going to put it out there. My opinion is that horror is the only genre that embraces the level of emotion and the level of fear or sadness or trauma terror all of these feelings that people do experience and some of us experience on a level that's disconcerting yeah that that's the only genre that can like tolerate it that will like embrace it show like reflect it back to you and mm -hmm. be like we're, we're not gonna we're not gonna run away from this like we're looking at this freaking awful disastrous thing that's happened and it's after effects and we're going to like keep the camera on it and I don't and it's just I don't know I just I just felt like you know sometimes I can deal with that sometimes I can't you know mm -hmm. but I, but it's good to know like hey there's this whole like genre that's like we're not we're not going to run away from we're not going to run away from mental illness we're not going to run away from you know um, despicable characters that represent you know other things to you know in the movie we're not going to run away from the after effects of a traumatic experience you know like it's just mm -hmm. it's really important to me to to kind of discover that and I I do admit that I'm coming to this later in life you know and um, I have been schooling myself like literally with books and by watching things. So that is, that's my story on how I came to it. I love it. Like I, I, that's my biggest, I think joy when we talk about like, or anyone I can talk about horror with because it, it's all unique in perspective and horror is triggering to people on different levels. You know, so what mm -hmm. someone, someone might find something scary. Someone else is like, that's laughable. Um, and there's just levels of, um, you know, there's all the, in within horror that you've got comedic horror, you've got like psychological horror, you've got like all these little subgenres that kind of focus in on certain things. And I tend to love the horror that stays with me a few days afterwards. And I, I sincerely love that feeling where I a horror movie because it's leaked into my brain I can't get the images out and I can't stop thinking about it and and usually horror films you know they can really do that to someone like um I mean it's not just a drama or a feel-good movie that gets me thinking um, good horror really provokes you and makes you like you say Jess it's like a way to study your own fears almost too like it's it's interesting it's 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 everyone gets you know, everyone's kind of freaked out by their own thing, and um, the genre is just so big. And um, I love hearing everyone's different takes on it because there are certainly everyone has a different take on it on horror, and I all think it's valid. And I totally love seeing where people are coming from because, I mean, I've grown up and I just feel like at times people just stare at me like, "You really love horror," and it's like. I, trust me, I do not get off on the fact of people suffering or this terror, but there's there's some sort of um, there's some sort of awesome like fear and high that I think I got when I first started watching or reading horror, and it was a safe fear, like it was a safe high, like I was confined to a story, but um, yeah, I just there was something in it that I loved being scared because it just it affected my thought pattern and. Um, you know, it, it it's it's one of those things where any time a movie can any movie gets me thinking about it for a few days afterwards, I know it was a good movie. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Like, um, I and so yeah, I I I think it's so cool you guys are doing this, like because you know the genre isn't you know I feel like everyone I run into in my life they're like oh god Peggy I don't want to see that no. <laughs> you know, like oh, oh yeah, oh Jeff, Peggy. Do you, Jeff, do you get that a lot or no? I get that a lot, a, <laughs> a ton, as a matter of fact. Because I, I mean, I'm one of those people where I mean, I, I do watch my TV shows that I that I keep up with and all of those things. But at any given time, on any given day, if you come to my house and you just happen to catch me watching something, nine times out of ten. It's a horror movie or a 
a show that's based on horror. So, I mean, I'm, I'm always consuming that and people, I know my mom used to say that, that junk's going to corrupt your mind. I'm like, mom, it's a movie, you know, it, it's <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm fine. It, it's okay. And I, and for me at this point, um, I, I actually approach horror movies and shows from a writer's perspective ah. uh, because I, you know, I've been working on a couple of different things, you know, writing some things. And you know, so I like to look at a lot of different movies from a lot of different uh, areas of the horror genre, because totally you know, what I'm, what I'm working on right now is it, it's an anthology. Um, and, you know, it's, I, I want to pull from different areas of horror. So, uh, so that's why I like to watch it as much as I do because it, it kind of helps me get a little, uh, get a little more creative when I'm writing and I'm going through that process. Oh, I can see that completely. That's awesome. Yeah, totally. Totally. Like I, 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 I get a lot of like, um, it's, I'm not always watching horror, but I rarely watch movies that aren't intense, you know, um, in some way, you. shape, or form. So, um, you know, even comedies, I love, like, you know, stuff that's, like, way over the top. Um, so I get a lot of, like, you know, uh, rejections when I, you know, in the past when <laughs> I, when was that? Yeah. I got a lot of rejections when I ask people to watch, go to the movies with me. It's usually I, a no. And I usually, and so I've, I pretty much stopped asking people, you know what I mean? Cause then it's like when, if you like, I don't know, I just, I, I just know it's going to be a no, you know, like I, I'll just go by myself and I, I like going to the movies by myself. That's not a problem, but like, there's like once in a while you kind of want some company, you know, so I'll like ask a friend and I'm like, are you into this movie? Cause I'm going to go see it. And usually it's, you know, it, they could go either way, but with my family, my dad's the only one who could watch, who can tolerate to watch movies like that are intense, you know, that I like, you know, like I went to go see, um, I went to go see Joker um, with Joaquin ah. Phoenix. I went to go see, I've seen that eight, I saw that eight times in the theater. As I really, Whoa. yeah, I really appreciated that movie. I don't really care about the haters. I know a lot of people hate on that movie and that's really not any of my business. I really loved that movie. It spoke to me and um, I said, and like nobody in my family would go see that with me, um, but my dad went and like, I remember driving to the Alamo and like explaining to my dad the story. I'm like, daddy, like the movie is really, really dark. Like it's not just dark. It's really dark. And he's like, that's all right. And I was explaining the whole entire movie to him, like including spoilers and everything. And he was like, I'm good. I'm good. We went, he loved it. <laughs> But then again, this is the man that like, you know, when I was little, I was watching Death Wish, the Charles Bronson series. I was watching that with him. So like, so like that's, you know, just, just like your experience with like your cousins and like the oh. horror movies. Like my dad didn't hold my hands down, but like, but like that, he was watching action movies all the time and I was watching them alongside him, you know, so. Oh my God. You know, I just realized we all have that in common. We were all watching such wildly inappropriate things at such young ages. Completely. Like, yeah. completely. Uh, it, and, you know, God bless my parents. Like, shout out to my mother who, <laughs> good God. I mean, the, she had four girls and the only way she could get a moment's peace was, I know I would stop moving if you put me in front of a television. So right. I think she just stopped monitoring what I was looking at. And it's just, it, it cracks me up that we all kind of went there like we all saw complete like inappropriate violence or horror or something and we're relatively decent people i think we've yeah, turned out okay. i mean I, I i i always want to say that but like people who know me well who like know all of my issues like i'm a lovely <laughs> person and i'm friendly but like you know i've got my problems so it's like i always want to say like I'm all right. I turned out all right. And I'm like, did I know? Like, did yeah, I know? Like, now stop it. Now you're making me second guess it. Cause now I'm thinking the same thing. Like, wait, did I turn out all right? Did I? Oh, right? Wait, did I? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that's like, it's, it's so funny. Cause I mean, I mean, 
I, I don't know how old you guys are, but I, I feel like we all kind of grew up in the same era of that. Like, um, oh, definitely. It, it, because I, it, we all kind of were in the same decade and it just, the horror movies of that decade were, I mean, you pretty much had like, I mean, I had never seen Nightmare on Elm Street, but I had nightmares about Freddy Cougar like 10 years before I finally saw Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah, um, totally. He was totally all over the media and everywhere. And I mean, I still remember the vivid nightmares of Freddy Cougar when I was like six years old. I mean, they are seared into my brain. Um, but it, it's so funny how we all kind of had that opportunity to see wildly inappropriate things um yeah it's such I mean, a young age it, i mean jeff i don't know about you know your friends and your family but like you know talking to my husband and just to my friends you know um we're all around the same age and we've all had that same experience like <laughs> you know it's like it has nothing to do with like how like good certain people's parents were or whatever you know it was just everybody watched inappropriate things in the 80s i don't know it just <laughs> it just happened <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It just it just happened. I mean, whether it was watching horror movies or watching the action movies that had a lot of violence. I mean, I remember going to the theater with my mom, and we watched uh, the whole like the whole trilogy. And maybe they have more now, but uh, we watched the best of the best movies. Really. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's like now, I mean, thinking, you know, if, if a movie like that came out today, would I take my kids and go see that? Absolutely not. I mean, oh I, I was hesitant to take my, my oldest son to see uh, Black Panther, which is crazy. Oh, but wow. I took, him, I took him to see it. And, you know, and, but I, I just think like back in the day watching that and uh, Blind Fury. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, movies like that I'd, I'd watch with, with my mom or with an uncle and, you know, no one even really bad at the and thought about it. You know? it just, I, okay, I, I have a, dis movie. that's so, so hysterical, Jeff, because I think my mother, I'll never forget it. Like she loved the alien um, trilogy of the, the aliens franchise. And I remember she would constantly, if that was on TV, she'd drop anything and watch it. And I mean, they aired it midday. And I remember being like, I don't know what these alien things are, but I don't like them. And I hope they're not real. And what the hell is this? <laughs> but she, yeah. again, she didn't, it's like, she didn't even know I was in the room at times. It, it was just like, she kind of was like hunkered in and watching. And I just was like, yeah, okay. I'm just, you know, benefiting off of her you know kind of getting her horror and and you know she barely likes horror so it was always very fun to me when my mom would watch something scary nice i i uh i like piggybacking on what jeff said i i'm so much more careful about what wolfgang my son ah. watches you know like i just um i'm i'm loose with him in terms of like you know um like he he watched all of the marvel you know, Avengers okay. movies when he, you know, like, you know, when they came out like a year ago or whatever and blah, blah, blah. And he's gone to see Star Wars, you know, with us in the theaters and stuff. And, um, but I, I don't let him watch anything that's, you know, at all like scary for real scary or that's inappropriate. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, no, thank you. You know what I mean? Like the, the superhero stuff is kind of, it's kind of different because it's like very like fantastical and it's fantasy. You know what I mean? Yeah. But um, I don't like, I can't imagine like he, I was probably his age, you know, when I was watching action movies with my dad. And I mean, like, yeah. you know, like the Steven Seagal movies, the Charles Bronson movies. Like I, the Charles Bronson movies, is what know? gets me. I, I love that your your father was watching Death Wish with his daughter. I mean, oh, there's he, nothing yeah, I mean, better it, than that. It's, you know, it was, you know, Death Wish 4. It was, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, it was all of these movies. I know. And like, <laughs> I would never in a million years let Wolfgang watch that. And I'm pretty, like, I'm the lax mom among, like, the mom's group. You know what I mean? Like, 
I know a lot of his a lot of his uh, friends' parents are get surprised that he's been going to the theater to the movies with me as long as he has, you know, because I started <laughs> taking him to the movies when he was like two years old, you know. Um, Perfect to watch, time. But, but to watch appropriate movies, you know, what I mean? <laughs> like not taking him to like go see, you know, like. A David Lynch film? <laughs> or, yeah, I'm not taking him to, you know, to go see, you know, a reshowing of Terminator 2, you know what I mean? Which, by the <laughs> way, I watched Terminator 2 when I was 11. I saw it twice in the movie theaters, like, you know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah, you, you, no, you're absolutely right. That came, what year did that come out, 90? That was 90, 91. Yeah, yeah I was, I, I was the same age, and it was the same, I mean, sorry to drop a bomb on both of you but I mean it wasn't the Terminator that had me for that one I just was psychotically <laughs> in love with Edward Furlong like I I thought we should be married at that point I remember I was like in sixth grade and then he did Pet Cemetery 2 right after that and I just was yeah. like oh we are destined this man and I <laughs> God. I mean I literally I think I cried in my bedroom thinking like what if I can't meet him what will happen Aww. to me <laughs> That's how, uh-huh. you know, dramatic I got and in love with the actors it, themselves at movies. So, but yeah, that was definitely, we were really young when that came out and that's a ton of, ton of violence, <laughs> ton of, so ton, much, you know, so much. Yeah. Um, so I have a question and it's a question that we ask every episode. Um, Peggy, on a scale of one to five headstones, five being, you know, the best, one being not so great. What would you rank, um, what would you rate Rosemary's Baby? Oh, I love the gravestones, by the way. Just love it. Um, I, I totally give this five gravestones. Um, it's, it's, um, not just because it's a classic and everything, but it, for me, it it hits a, I think for women in general, it hits a very, Um, it's a very, very terrifying, real kind of horror for us. Um, you know, the, the history of women being gaslit or being looked at as hysterical when they're, you know, trying to protect themselves or something. Um, it, it's, it's top notch horror because it makes you think for days and the performances are unforgettable. The, you know, it's just so much history in that movie. So definite five. Okay. Um, and the other sort of like a the other weighted system we have is to ask whether or not you would get the movie <laughs> tattooed on your arm. I love this question when you guys started this because I burst out laughing, going, "Should I tell them I have psoriasis and I can't get tattoos?" So it never has ever <laughs> occurred to me. Well, well um, yeah, like this is like you know in a in a make pretend world where everybody's okay with getting tattoos absolutely. and nothing prohibits them you know <laughs> i think i would totally be on board with getting a rose some sort of rosemary tattoo on me i i wouldn't be ashamed oh, wow. it's a good one cool i think that's the first is that the first time we've gotten that response jeff right yeah 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 i, yeah. So. Yeah. I mean right, just a it it just seems like I, I just a perfect core shot of her face or just a little nod to the poster, like you said. I would be proud mm-hmm. to wear that on my skin. Nice. All right. So we got a five headstones and a yes to a tattoo. Jeff, <laughs> uh, moving along to you, my, my brother, what, uh, how many headstones would you read? Um, I go back and forth because this is such a great, it's such a great classic and I want to give it five. Um, but I'm going to be a little stingy and I'll give it a four and a half. Hey, that's not too stingy to me. <laughs> um, which is the high, which is the highest that I've given anything while we've been doing this podcast. Um, even, even higher than would you rather. Um, Ooh, that's well, saying something, Jess. That is, that is. All right, my, my teeth just fell out, Jeff. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, even higher than, than would you rather. Um, Can't believe this. I I know this is like a. I'm very happy. It's just making me happy. (laughs) My mind just exploded. My teeth fell out. (laughs) My wig fell off, like flew off, you know, all of it. (laughs) You imploded. (laughs) I did. I did. Yeah. All right. So Um, would. 
would you get this tattooed? That is a great question. Um, trying to think. You know, I pro I probably would. I'm just I'm trying to think of what go, I Jack, would get, go. But I would I would probably get a tattoo just because this is a classic. And um, yeah, I'd, I'd have to think about what to get, but I probably would. Cool. Okay. Wow. Whoa, baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, I myself would give this movie um, four and a half headstones. And the reason being is that I feel like for five, for a full five, I mm -hmm. have to I have to also include the like I absolutely love it factor in. Mm -hmm. And while I like this movie a lot and it's beautiful and I think it's like perfect, um, I'm not like in love with it. You know, so I can't give it like a full five because that would be no, like, that's, that would it, that would be giving like my heart. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, but like, and and to me, like again, that's the great thing about horror. Everyone has a different perspective and I mean, but the fact that both of you guys gave it four and a half is pretty cool to me because, I mean, I think it's one of the best up there. Like, if, if, I had to, if I had to rank horror films as a top ten, this would definitely be in the mix somewhere. This has to be in the top ten. I agree. I think this movie is just, I think it's just a, <laughs> an amazing movie. I think it's a perfect movie. Um, the only The only downside, but it I understand it for the time and the place is that there's literally only two people of color in this entire movie and one oh of them God. one of them is an extra and the other one <laughs> plays the um elevator man. Yeah. Yes, yeah. and he also there's like, I mean oh man, he doubled as the sailor in the dream too. Right. I remember cuz we get to see him in is is a yeah, the elevator man and the the sailor on the boat, but you're absolutely right. You know, and that, that's, I mean, that's like not a little thing, but it's also not uncommon. It's not unusual of its time. You yeah. Know? Like, like if it was made like nowadays and that was the case, I, I have a lot more to say about that. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. You're right. Um, it's interesting. You put that up to like, as a reflection of its, um, of, of its time almost, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I like um, that. So I would give it four and a half. I do not think I would get a tattoo of it only because it's so extreme for me personally. Um, there's like whole sections of this movie that are, that are very triggering um, for personal things that I've gone through. Like, you know, as a, as a, as a new mom, as a, someone who just gave birth as, you know, a pregnant person. So I, I just think it's, I can't like, I don't want a reminder of that, you know, yeah. on my arm. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, or your back. Or something yeah, like exactly. That. Like I, exactly. Like I, I, you know, carry that around with me as it is. So I can do that. Oh, like, my son is here and he wants to get his little voice heard on the podcast. Sorry, guys. So That's adorable. Um, so, um, honey, go out, go out there, please. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's our rating and ranking system i'm so glad to hear that we're all on the same you know the similar page um, yeah definitely with the ranking and i love hearing that you guys would get you guys are like the true blue like horror fan you know um experts so um, it's really cool to hear that this is one that you would have tattooed that that's that's cool to hear oh i i mean again and i i can't thank both of you enough for letting me just come and spew my happy guts about horror and i i can't wait to see what you guys are going to keep tackling um because it's it's really fun listening thank you so much yeah, seriously i mean i it's you guys are you guys have both very unique voices and again I, I love talking horror, so if you ever want to smack me around again and make me watch a movie of your choice, please do, and um, I'd be down. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for coming on, Peggy. Um, do you want to tell people where they can find you online? Um, I am pretty much, um, I, I mainly live um, 
socially online, I, I post most of my art or my handwork. My knitting is Instagram, um, Cinepeg, that's C-I-N-E-P-E-G instead of cinema, Cinepeg. Um, so yeah, it just made sense to me, guys. I'm not that creative, but um, uh, yeah, I'm usually there and I have an Etsy store under the same name. And um, I ironically, I have a pair for sale of Rosemary's Baby right now. It's, um, oh, cool. It's the, uh, the, the images I have are in, um, it's, uh, let's see, we've got Rosemary screaming. I've got the image and font of the, the cover of the, the carriage part in the, mm -hmm. the title. I've got the iconic a moment you just spoke, you spoke of earlier, Jess, the Ruth Gordon um, mini through the eye hole in, the, mm. in the, the doorway. And the other one I always loved getting was um, a shot of Rosemary on the phone when she's, you know, trying to get out of everything towards the end. And she just has the most pensive, terrified look on her face. Awesome. So, that sounds so yeah. cool. And I can speak personally to everybody who's listening. I can speak personally to how talented and how, how talented and creative uh, Peggy is with these arm warmers and how like just Aww. cozy, cozy and lovely they are. Um, I own two pairs and I, and I love them. I wear them when I'm watching movies. I wear them when I'm not watching movies. Um, they make me feel all safe and cozy. So thank you so much for coming on. Oh my God. Thank you guys again. Loved it. Had so much fun. It really brightened up my quarantine. Awesome. And, um, Jeff, uh, we will, we do not know what we're going to be talking about next week, right? <laughs> but, no, not, not yet, but we will uh, very soon figure that out and figure out which movie we may review. Um, I have a couple ideas, but, um, but yeah. Nice. Oh, um, if I could mention lastly, last thing, um, on Instagram, I run a page called Wolfgang Vintage Books. We are starting a book club and it is going to meet probably at the end of May. We're talking 2020 here. Awesome. The, the book selection was announced today. It is the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by, by Grady Hendrix, who is a writer of many horror books. Um, all of them are awesome. This one, I'm, I've already started reading. I wanted to make sure it was, you know, a decent one for the, for the club. And it rules so far. Um, I think a lot of people will like it. So if you are interested, head on over to Instagram at Wolfgang Vintage Books. And you can join the club. It's going to be very low key. And nobody needs any more pressure these days. So <laughs> it's just going to be fun. And that does sound so fun. Yeah, it, it's going to be. So thank you so much, guys, for joining us today and our discussion of Rosemary's Baby. And we hope that you have a lovely week. Until next time, and I bye. am Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> that was Wolfgang. <laughs> I love, I'm sorry, that was the best part for me. <laughs> um, and goodbye from myself, from Jeff. Jeff, you want to say goodbye? <laughs> See you guys next time. And Peggy, thanks again for being with us. And oh, subscribe. God. So okay. fun. I loved it. You guys are great. Thank you again. All right. Thanks a lot. I just want to